This is Larry Johnson from the New Media Consortium. If you could just tap in the chat window for me and just uh, indicate that you're able to hear me. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. This is another webinar in the Distinguished Series of Live with Linda webinars where we are featuring noted thought leaders in the education world and beyond to come in and to share with us their perspectives. Our host is Linda Wayman, the CEO of lynda.com, and we very much appreciate their support in making this series possible. I'd like to mention a couple of links that are related to this series. We have um, the NMC's Facebook page where you can follow um, the NMC. That is uh, facebook.com slash new media consortium and pre-register for events like this and others and we look forward to uh, seeing you do that. We had over 125 pre-registrations for today's event and that's a new record and we uh, are <coughs> certain that is because of our host and I see all the webcams are up and so I would uh, like to pass the baton over to Linda Wayman. Thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you so much, Larry, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's great to see the interest and enthusiasm around this topic, and we're so honored today to have you here with us, Will. And um, I've really enjoyed reading your book, and I thought maybe we would start the interview with you sharing a little bit of background about yourself and what led you to be focused on this mission. Absolutely. Well, first, let me say thanks for having me today. I really appreciate it. And Larry, I want to thank you, too, for all the great work that you guys are doing at NMC um, in kind of trying to move the conversation forward. It's really been helpful. Um, my background, briefly, I, I, I sometimes say there's only three things you really need to know about me, and that is that, uh, number one, I'm a parent. I have a uh, soon-to-be 12- and 14-year-old uh, uh, son and daughter. And uh, um, as a parent, I'm looking at their education and and asking a lot of questions and feeling a lot of frustration and that really drives a lot of my passion for this. But I was a public school educator for 22 years, um, 18 years in the classroom, three years in administration, and I've also been a blogger for almost a decade. And um, how I got here basically uh, uh, started on my blog and it was a place where I just became very transparent about my own thinking and my own learning and, and certainly my own practice as well. And um, it was uh, one of the first places, not the first, but one of the first places where there was kind of a classroom person who was uh, sharing out and, and looking at these tools and starting to ask questions around, well, what does all this stuff mean? You know, what are the implications of these connections that we have? And it's just kind of snowballed from there um, to the point where I've just started doing a lot of speaking, written uh, three books now. and. Uh, um, gotten a chance to go to some pretty amazing schools, visit with pretty amazing teachers, and, and have learned a lot about um, education and learning uh, in, in the process. So it's been, uh, it's been a pretty amazing 10 years. Well, thank you for that. And that, that helps give your presentation some context. I know you've put together a PowerPoint that you wanted to share with us. And so it might be a good moment to launch into that, and that should get the discussion started. All right, great. Well. Um, I just wanted to, you know, take a couple of minutes just to set the context. I think it's important that uh, we're all at somewhat of the same starting point with this. And so I just wanted to share kind of what, what I see the world, uh, kind of what I see happening in the world right now, and, and kind of the bigger questions that uh, a lot of these technologies and all these changes are beginning to push upon us. I don't think anyone would disagree that the world is changing in some pretty um, interesting and uh, challenging ways right now. Um, if you look uh, pretty much anywhere, uh, read the headlines these days uh, in the States with politics, uh, which certainly with media and art, um, all of these uh, institutions and all of these professions that have been around for a very long time are being impacted in, in some pretty big ways by the social technologies, these abilities that we have to connect with one another and share with one another in unprecedented ways using the web and, and using the technologies that are being built for the web. Um, but the question that I'm asking is, you know, what's up with education? Because uh, we don't seem to really be, be responsive, very much at least, um, to a lot of these challenges and a lot of these opportunities as well. I don't want to paint this as a as a totally bleak picture. It's not. I mean, this is an amazing time for learning. Uh, there's no question about that either. Um, but I do think that, you know, there are, are uh, 
a lot of these other kinds of entities and institutions and professions are struggling. They're in the midst of really re-examining what they do and how they do it. And I just haven't felt like that's been something that education has, they have not, we have not picked up that, that conversation very well yet. We, we have not been willing to this point, I don't think, to really look closely at our roles as schools, as teachers, what happens in classrooms in, in the light of this environment, which uh, again, it is very different from the one that most of us grew up with and most of us, um, you know, uh, kind of went to school in and whatever else. So, you know, learning is really changing right now and it, it's, not, uh, it's not just about going to some place for, at some particular time to learn about some subject. It really is more about passion, more about self-direction. When we have access to all of this content and information and knowledge and we have access to all of these people, uh, that's really different, and and I think it's summed up pretty much by you know that that statement right there that if we have access, and I know there are lots of kids and lots of families that don't still have access, but if we do, um, we pretty much have an easy connection to the people and the resources that we need to learn whatever we have a passion to learn, and that's just decidedly different from when I was a kid. Um, it was not that I couldn't learn things that I wanted to learn, but it was a lot more difficult to do that, and. Uh, so the, the question today becomes, again, what does that change for us? I mean, does that change what we have to prepare kids for? Does it change the things that we teach kids? Does it change the literacies around learning? And in just about every case, I think it does. I, I show this example often. This is Motuto, which is an iPhone app. And, um, you know, I, I think it's really interesting in, in terms of, of our ability now to even use the devices in our pockets to begin to connect to all of this. Motuto, basically, if you're a student and you have a problem with your algebra homework or your geometry homework or whatever, you can fire up that app and log in and someone at the Motuto, wherever they are, will say, how can I help you? And basically the, the student can take a picture of the problem, send it to this tutor, and um, over you know, however long it takes, those two can kind of work out and, and, and that student can get personalized instruction around that particular problem. And I'm not here to, to you know, kind of discuss the merits of that particular app, but I do think that 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 affordance, that, that ability to do that, and, and when you think about all the different ways that we have to do that now, I, I just think that's a, a, a pretty clear indication that this is not business as usual. It really is anytime, anywhere, but most importantly, it's, it's this any one piece, and that's what these networks and communities that we're building online uh, around our passions, that's, I think, where the real fuel for learning is. Um, sure, we, we have access to content and information, but this people piece of it is, is what I think is very profound and has um, huge implications for us. Um, there are two billion people who are online right now. There will be five billion by the end of this decade, most of them coming from emerging countries, third world countries using mobile technologies. But the deal with schools right now is that we're looking at that as saying, well, that's two billion potential predators. We don't want those people involved in our kids' learning lives, uh, especially in schools. We want to block and filter and just stop that from happening. Um, but I look at that and I say, you know what, I think that's two billion potential teachers for my kids and for the kids that we have in schools. And again, I'm not suggesting that every one of those people is, is someone who could uh, be a good teacher. And there are people who mean my kids harm online. I understand that. But um, I really think that we have to reframe the way that we look at these potential connections to try to take advantage of the, the vast opportunities that are out there right now and the, and the people who are, are um, out there, you know, using these tools to connect already. Um, feels like there's almost two billion ways to connect, and I know that that graphic is probably difficult to see, but um, it's just kind of a color wheel of, of many of the social tools that we're using right now to blog, to share pictures, to upload videos, and, and to do polling, whatever else. Um, the key word in the middle of that graphic, if you can see it, is the word social, however. You're not going to find Photoshop or Excel or PowerPoint on this, pin, on this uh, color wheel because they're not social. You, you can't really connect through those. Every one of these tools, and this is just such a small slice of what's out there right now, but um, have a social element to them and a connection point, which um, again allows us to learn with other people who are using those tools as well. And, and the explosion of the uses of these tools is, has been just pretty amazing when you look at it. Again, this graphic just uh, shows uh, you know, what happens in 60 seconds 
on the web, and a lot is happening on the web, and it's, uh, it's growing uh, even more quickly. So uh, it's not going away. This is something that uh, we're going to have to deal with, whether we like it or not, and whether we feel comfortable with it or not. Um, it has huge implications for literacy, obviously. This is the National Council of Teachers of English uh, bullet points on literacy. Um, from about three years ago now, and you can see some of these are, uh, are pretty daunting, I think, when it comes to assessing our kids' ability to do this, managing, analyzing, synthesizing multiple streams of simultaneous information. I mean, that's uh, not something that I can see in my kids' curricula uh, anywhere in school. Um, that's not something that, that uh, many adults, many teachers in the room are really um, comfortable with either. Um, and I actually talked to the uh, vice chair of the of NCTE, and, and I had said in a presentation that she was at that I thought, you know, about 85% of kids probably weren't literate, um, graduates weren't literate by that definition, and she came up later and she said it's more like 95% of kids. So um, those are challenges. has huge implications for us as learners uh, because it is about networks. It's about the connections that we have. It's not just about what we carry around in our heads any longer. It's, it's really our ability to access that information and access the people that we need to learn with or to collaborate with. And it has huge implications for schools as well. I mean, uh, this is, it is going to change us. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced of that. I don't even think that that's uh, up for debate any longer. And the question is, are we going to, you know, kind of go kicking and screaming into this, or are we really going to sit down and have some profound conversations about what that change looks like? And I, I definitely hope that, um, that it's, it's the latter. Um, we need to have some really open and frank conversations about uh, what these uh, technologies mean for our, our learning world right now. Basically, my kids live on the left hand of this kind of comparison, and I live on the right hand side. Um, you know, there's not a lot that's really personalized. There's not a lot of real creativity. Um, there's not a lot of even real digital work that's going on in their classrooms. And, you know, schools are still pretty time and place and, and teacher directed. I can, I can tell you with almost, well, with pretty, pretty close certainty what my son will be studying in math class on May 23rd, 2013. Um, you know, I know where the curriculum is going. And um, it's a very predictable thing that we do in schools right now. But learning is not that way any longer. It is really self-directed, it is global, and it is unpredictable. I have no idea what my kids are going to be learning when they come home from school, when they get online, and they begin to access, again, the, the knowledge and the people who basically are sharing the passions that, uh, that they share. And I guess my question is, you know, isn't that what classrooms should begin to look like? Shouldn't they be more open? Shouldn't they be more transparent? Shouldn't they reflect more accurately, I think, the type of learning that is happening now? Um, in these environments, in these contexts. And uh, right now, that's, that's really not happening. Just one last point, and, and um, I think this is an important point. You know, kids aren't waiting for us to make this a part of the curriculum. They're going home, and they're doing this. And, and uh, this MacArthur Foundation report from a couple of years ago uh, found very clearly that um, kids are using social technologies, uh, and they're using them to stay in touch with their friends. But there's also a growing number of them that are using them in learning contexts as well. And, you know, this really isn't about social media as much as it is about learning media. And so kids are going home, as Mimi Ito, the writer of the report, um, says, you know, in this quote, she says, kids are learning on the Internet in a self-directed way. They look around for information, then they find people who can help them learn what they want to learn. And the problem is right now, no one's teaching kids to do this. Um, they're kind of out there on their own. They're kind of trying to figure this out. And this is where they really need us now. They don't need us for all the, the content, for all the knowledge. Uh, that stuff is important, and certainly kids need a base of that uh, to, to make sense of the world. But I'm really thinking that, that uh, the main focus of schools right now ought to be like just a laser focus on how do we learn with access? How do we make sense of this world and really help kids begin to leverage this moment from a learning standpoint because there's a, a powerful opportunity here that I think right now is pretty much being ignored. So that's a little bit of context and um, I'm more than happy to, to start a conversation about that. Great. Well, we're getting a lot of questions from the audience, but I think, <clears throat> first of all, you're really framing this around K through 12 education. And probably a lot of participants who are with us today 
are in public institutions, private institutions, as well as higher education. Um, and so, but I think that these issues are relevant at all of those different checkpoints, really. And yeah, um, part of what it, it, you know, one of the questions that we're getting, and you know, it's sort of an obvious uh, question, is uh, how do you ensure that a student is going to get a well-rounded perspective on your area of, of subject matter that you're teaching um, if, it's, if it's just completely open and personalized. And so can you speak a little bit to where you've seen a successful synthesis of the approach of being open but also having some insurance about the integrity of what is actually being uh, taught and learned? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't think that I said that it, it should be completely open and self-directed. I mean, that's, that's um, I, I don't advocate that either. Um, but I do think that there are many schools now that are moving to more inquiry-based approaches where they're allowing kids to form and ask their own questions and pursue answers to those questions in a, in a much more personalized way and, and in ways that motivate them more. And that the interesting dance that the teacher has to do right now is making sure that those uh, those individual kinds of of, um, of processes that kids are using those those you know those paths that they're taking as as individual students meet up to those goals and objectives and standards that we have that either the state is is giving us or that our school districts are giving us or that we have you know just in our curriculum so. Um, it's the it's easier if we had every child basically give gave every child the same experience on this you know on the same day in the same way and assessed in the same way that's the easy way to do it and that's that's the way we've been doing it and we have really structured this system um, with that kind of ease in mind I think that the whole standardized testing thing is the easiest way to assess whether or not kids are getting the things that we want them to get and I think one of the frustrations is you know. Uh, we're not trusting the teachers to to make those evaluations and those assessments. So um, there are many more schools now that are moving to an inquiry-based approach. There are many more schools that are moving, or I should say many more classrooms at least, that are moving toward really allowing kids to use social tools to um, find their own path through the curriculum. But um, I think the role of the teacher in that in that interaction absolutely changes to one who is a co-learner, a, a real great questioner, but also someone who then can align the learning that's happening in that classroom to those expectations that we all have that we want kids to meet. It's a much more difficult way to do it, but um, it's uh, it's something that I think uh, is much more beneficial to kids right now. The way that we are putting through kids through a curriculum right now is not serving them. Um, very well at all in a world where they could personalize and they could individualize in the ways they can right now. I agree with you um, in in principle, but I think it is sort of a hard sell if you don't um, wrap some kind of structure around it. And I think that teachers really struggle with this too, who want to move more towards this type of teaching, but they are going to be asked by, you know, the administrators, by the parents, by everybody, how are we going to assess success? What are we going to call success? And how are we going to ensure that a core curriculum is still practiced? And so I, I guess my question to you would be, can you give maybe a concrete case study example of where you've seen the synthesis of the, of the sort of old and new approaches being successful? Well, I, I think probably the most obvious one is Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia, where Chris Lehman is the principal, where um, they have a one-to-one -one, um, laptop program there where every student has a laptop. They um, have opened up you know, just about everything as much as they can. They're a public school in Philadelphia, so there are some restrictions on what they can do. But, um, you know, Chris tells the story, and I tell the story a lot too, because I just think it's a great one of, of uh, you know, environmental science kids in that class, in that school three years ago. Um, basically, they developed their own curriculum to study environmental science, and, and they built it around this idea of actually building a biodiesel generator that uh, could provide electricity to um, people who didn't have electricity. And, um, the, you know, the kind of wonderful thing about that story for me is that the teacher didn't know how to do this when they set out to do it. Um, but th what the teacher did know how to do was align the experience that those kids had in 
finding those experts and those environmental scientists and engineers and in you know planning and and literally laying out and designing this this generator and going through the process of building it and going through the process of of actually in you know making it happen it's being used right now in in uh, a couple of villages in Guatemala for people to generate electricity but you know the teacher was able to ask questions and 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 move the kids in the direction that they needed to go to actually finish the project but also pass the test and and align to you know those those kind of core competencies and those those standards that that they wanted those kids to get um, and in, in that school, that's pretty much what inquiry looks like there. You know, the kids are given much more license to go and pursue the things that they have an interest in. And then teachers are really, really deeply invested in making sure that those experiences, you know, make people, make people who are traditional, you know, who want traditional expectations and outcomes, that those people are happy as well. But that kids are leaving that school, I think, with a much different sense of what the world looks like, what their role as a learner is in the world, and what their their you know ability to learn is as compared to other kids in other schools who are experiencing a very traditional, very laid out linear curriculum that is being delivered to them without much choice on their part as to how they go through those, you know, how to how they get to those outcomes and those standards. Now, is that happening at scale? No, it's not. Um, is it happening in, in classrooms? Yeah, you know, we can point to a lot of different classrooms now where teachers are kind of are going down that path. Um, but look, as you said, it's it's a really difficult conversation to have right now because we are so invested in these outcomes and these definitions that we have around what student achievement is, what student performance is. Um, those are very concrete measures that we've set up for ourselves and to suggest that we can do it better with something that maybe isn't as concrete. It's a very difficult conversation for people to engage in. And I think there's also a lot of questions about how. You know, like in, in the example that you just gave, how are those students assessed? Do you, do you uh, have an understanding of how the grading is done? Or is, are there grades? Um, how do we measure? Uh, or do we measure at all? What's your thought about that? Well, I, we have to measure, certainly, and um, I think assessment is an important piece of what we do in schools, but I would argue that I don't think uh, assessments that are standardized to the point where every child is expected to reach every outcome in the same way, again, is that's not the best case scenario for kids. Um, look, you know, we've been doing performance assessments for a long, long time. We've been doing portfolio assessments. They take more time. I, I think one of the most discouraging quotes I've read in the last year was an article about a conversation in Massachusetts around assessment. And the person who was kind of leading the conversation came to the conclusion at the end of the day that we get the assessments that we have the time and money to implement. And you know the things we're talking about here take more time. And in some ways, they take more money. Um, but I, I just, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any question that seeing what a kid can actually do with the knowledge that he has, seeing what a student can actually create and share and continue to learn around whatever happens in the classroom, that's much more important to me than, than what happens on a standardized test that basically checks the boxes and says, yes, these, you know, this piece of knowledge or these, these uh, facts or these you know, very kind of basic skills um, are there. Um, so, it's difficult, and and uh, there are these are really big conversations that we have to be having. But again, I'll go back and say, as a parent, I am totally frustrated by a system that basically I see as driving all the creativity out of my kids, all of their um, kind of self direction, all of their passion, because we are so focused on making sure that we get over this one bar, this one outcome, and um, we do that at the expense, I think, of a lot of. Uh, of love of learning in our kids, unfortunately. I absolutely agree with you, and I'm sure most of the people on this uh, web and this webinar agree as well. Um, what? How do you think you can deal with the challenge of having students? I mean, this has always been a challenge as a teacher, having students at different skill levels, different types of learning styles, different even disabilities. Um, do you have any thoughts you can share about? how this new paradigm of teaching uh, relates to those types of differences? 
Well, that's always been an, a, a very difficult thing in the classroom. Um, we've always struggled with how to do that. And I th I don't, I'm not sure that this really changes that very much. We are, we're going to always um, be trying to figure out the best way to um, bring kids along together to make sure they can collaborate and learn together. Um, I'm not one that, that uh, you know, likes to separate out kids based on ability or, or based on accommodations or things like that as much as we can um, bring those kids into the fold and really make them a part of the classroom. I heard a, just an inspiring story um, last week when I was up in Toronto of a girl who had some visual impairments and some um, just communication and all sorts of other uh, things that were going on. and. Um, um, basically, long story short, she couldn't sit up um, because of, of, of a defect. And so they created a chair that allowed her to kind of sit in the chair. This was a very young kid, um, sit in the chair in a sandbox and be independent. Um, it was before this time, she was always kind of, you know, needing someone to be there and the kids wouldn't interact with her at all. But um, what was very cool was when she became independent, all of a sudden the kids came over and started playing with her and, and, and interacting with her. So I think it's a, an example, at least, of how you know, we can, I think, bring students together in, into common um, learning environments, regardless of, of differences, uh, most differences, at least. And I think that actually these technologies can facilitate that in, in some ways as well. Um, by, um, you know, personalizing again, by, by letting kids really um, be involved in their passions. Um, you know, I've seen some kids who are, are very difficult in class at times, but who really love to do artwork or to really love, who really love to express themselves in other ways. And I think, again, um, these, these tools can, can make that happen and facilitate that in some ways that maybe were more difficult to do when we didn't have these technologies. Well, one of the thoughts that I've had is if you allow students to um, kind of create their own learning paths and their own personal learning networks, as you call them, then the role of the teacher, instead of being the expert and sharing, you know, the same curriculum that everybody has shared, really does free up a little bit to give more personalized attention. I mean, it's just a different use of the teacher's time. Um, but in some ways, it's very liberating because um, really the focus could be more on working on a more individual level rather than having to kind of, you know, be a one-size-fits-all presentation that you deliver. Yeah, and I really think that the, the big shift is that um, t a teacher needs to be perceived as a learner uh, in the classroom by students. Uh, I, I've asked kids all the time, I say, you know, how much, do, how smart is your teacher? What does your teacher know? And they have an easy answer for that. They can tell you that. They, they have an opinion on that <laughs> right away. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to places like ratemyteachers.com and, and you can see the way that kids, you know, assess their teacher's knowledge. But if you ask a student, how does your teacher learn? Um, try it. They, they're clueless. They, they don't see the adults in the room as real learners, as people who are invested in their own learning as well. And I think that a lot of this comes back to that, to be honest with you. I think a lot of it comes back to the ability of the teacher in the room to really understand the types of learning networks and communities that are available right now, to be able to participate in those types of interactions online, and then be able to model that for the kids in their classrooms and bring those types of connections and networks in in appropriate ways. Again, not substitute everything that they're doing, not change everything that they're doing, but to, you know, so that kids kind of look and say, oh, so that's how you learned about this, or that's how you find information. That's how you manage, analyze, synthesize multiple streams of simultaneous information as the National Council of Teachers of English wants you to do, right? So um, I, I think there is a lot of, of, I don't know if pressure is the right word, but um, I think there's, there's a lot of, of uh, reasons why teachers need to begin to reflect on their own practice first. And we talk a lot about that in the book, actually, that it really starts with us. You know, the, the whole idea of, of changing classrooms and changing schools, uh, it has to start with individual teachers changing their own perspectives on their, their learning practice as well. And, um, you know, I, I like to say I think that's a great opportunity that we have. You know, it's a challenge, sure, but this is an amazing time uh, to be a learner. And uh, even though it's overwhelming and, and different and somewhat difficult at times, I think uh, uh, there's a, an amazing opportunity for every one of us, whether 
uh, where teachers are not, but certainly for educators um, to take advantage of and then begin to kind of bring that practice into their classrooms in some, some effective ways and appropriate ways as well. Well, tell us a little bit about your blog and the kinds of resources that you're creating and how they might help teachers adjust to this, um, create, you know, this adoption of personal learning networks. Well, you know, it's interesting because when I first started blogging, probably the first uh, six or seven years that I blogged, actually, I, I blogged primarily about the uses of these tools in the classroom. It was, I think, more of a, of a practical conversation that I had. Um, the first book that I wrote was pretty much all about tools. And, you know, how do you begin to implement those tools in ways that expand the classroom walls and, and really give um, some sense of what those networks look like. But my blogging over the last couple of years, especially, has um, taken on much more of a kind of a reform um, <laughs> kind of angle to it, you know, and, and an advocacy angle. I, I have uh, spent more time probably voicing my own frustrations and trying to answer, trying to not answer, but ask those really important questions around change, uh, trying to um, make sure that the conversation around reform is kind of uh, held to maybe a little bit of a different standard. I don't think that a lot of people who are talking about reform in schools right now really are, are seeing this lens that we're talking about here today, that um, that's something that's basically absent, in, in all honesty, from the conversation. So um, I've been trying in my own small way, with my own kind of small audience, to um, to, to begin those conversations, you know, how do, how do we really engage in ways that, uh, that talk about real change, um, transformation, if you will, rather than simply trying to do what we've been doing better. Um, that seems to be pretty much the, the level of the conversation nationally right now. We're just going to, you know, keep tweaking it and we're not going to change much. We're just going to figure out ways of doing it better. Whereas I think the conversation really needs to be around how do we do this very differently at this point? How do we, again, begin to rethink schools and classrooms and our roles as teachers in those classrooms? Well, I really kind of see at the core something you touched on earlier about how it's very predictable and formulaic to just go by a standardized testing system. And I think the problem feels overwhelming and daunting to define a framework um, other than something that's formulaic. And really what you're advocating is to be more flexible and adaptable and um, kind of inventive. And I think, you know, that's a very hard sell um, when you have a public system. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just see that as a really um, difficult yeah, you know, a, I don't disagree. Just argument. Yeah, I don't disagree, but I, I, I you know, I, I still think we have to have a conversation. I still think we need, to, I, we need to push that envelope. I mean, I don't think we have a choice, to be honest with you. Um, and look, you know, one of the things that that uh, we need to talk about, very frankly, is we need to raise the level of this profession. Um, we really do, um, and and we need to to get to the point where. Um, you know, teachers are the expert learners in the classroom, and right now, uh, education, teacher education, is really all about teaching. Um, and and not that we don't need a dose of that. We absolutely do need to understand the pedagogies that make for successful classrooms. But look, our emphasis has to be on on real, I think, um, creative and entrepreneurial learners who uh, can, can, you know, who we can trust to make those assessments and to, to get our kids to the point where we can individualize, we can personalize, um, and, and we also can know that they know the things we think they need to be able to know and to be able to do. That doesn't mean that, that we can't trust the people in classrooms right now, but they haven't been prepared for that type of a, you know, of a role. And, um, so that's a, that's a much bigger conversation. Um, I, I want teachers in the classroom. There's no question. I want my kids in classrooms and in schools. I, I love schools as places of learning, but I want those places to be very different, and that has to start with the individual teacher. That's a lot of the work we've been doing in, in powerful learning practice, which is the PD stuff I've been doing for the last five years with Cheryl Nussbaum Beach 
you know, trying to look at individual practitioners and say, how do you kind of reframe and retool so that you can see the world differently, but also you can act within that world differently. And it's a huge undertaking. It's a, it's a huge task, but, um, you know, it's got to start with the professionals in the room until we trust the people to be able to make those decisions and make those assessments, we're just going to keep doing what we've been doing because we understand that and, you know, we, we somewhat trust the outcomes that that, that system has given us. So it's, it's big. There's no question. Can you talk a little bit more about um, that other, the practice? I can't remember even what you Powerful said. Powerful learning but practice. That other, yeah. yeah, the other project that you, that you have, it sounds um, very relevant to this audience. Well, you know, Cheryl, Cheryl Nussbaum Beach, um, who is my, my colleague in that, uh, and who is a good friend, um, she, uh, you know, we got together about five years ago and we had a conversation around professional development because we were both dissatisfied with the type of PD work that we were doing. Um, I was going in and doing a lot of one, two day workshops around tools and, you know, it, it just wasn't really getting to, number one, it wasn't getting to the heart of the matter. It wasn't getting to that change question very much, but it would, just wasn't sticky either. You know, I mean, it's it's very difficult to to do six tools in eight hours and have people right. walk out of there, you know, and, and assume that they can actually begin to do any of it. So she had been using a model in Alabama that was really long-term job embedded professional development. So short story, I mean, what we do now is we get groups of educators, we put them into 100 person cohorts and we have them for eight months. We do face-to-face um, -face beginning and the end, but then we immerse them into these online communities and networks. And we get in there um, and we have a, a, just an amazing group of educators who have been helping us with this work for the last five years. We all kind of get into those spaces and, and we really um, try to engage those people in the types of interactions around learning that happen outside of those spaces, you know, in the real world now, in, in my real world at least. Uh, and it, it's been just really great work. It's a struggle. Uh, a lot of people um, you know, uh, get really mad at us because they just want to get in there and start learning tools. And we say, it's not about tools. It's really about learning dispositions. It's about understanding what these connections and these communities look like. And um, it's, uh, it, it's, been, uh, it's been the best work that I've done in the last five years, without doubt. And um, I think it's really moved the needle for, the, for a lot of the schools that, that have participated with us. But our universe is pretty small. You know, we've, we've worked with only about 4,000 teachers over the last five years. And um, so, you know, there's still a lot of work to do, obviously, in, in helping, helping schools understand what those, those, those learning communities look like. Well, you've given me a really great um, kind of new mantra, which is teacher as learner. Um, I think it's something that is, is quite profound. I think most people who are drawn to the teaching profession do love to learn. And it's one of the kind of wonderful byproducts of being a teacher that you get to learn. But I think being transparent to students about that you are also a learner um, is, is a very powerful idea. And I love that you shared that today. I think that's quite profound. Well, and you know, let me just say too that just as in many ways the system kind of has uh, driven that passionate learning kind of uh, feel that my kids have, you know, out of them in some ways when they go to school, I think it's done the same for teachers too. I mean, I, I think there are a lot of very creative, very passionate, very amazing and inspiring teachers who are just overcome by this system <laughs> and, you know, within three or four years, they, they just can't escape the fact that, that uh, this is really about the test and it's really about getting to those specific outcomes and, and they can't do a lot of the things that, that uh, you know, they're capable of doing. So, um, you know, I, I really do, I, I, I have a very kind of pessimistic view of, of uh, the, the effects of standardization and the effects of what we've been doing for the last 25 years especially. Um, and the effects that have had both on kids and teachers. Um, it's, it's just not a good situation right now at all, I don't think. No. Um, well, I wonder if there are any um, questions from the audience. I've been getting a few, but I've kind of woven them into um, what I've asked about. I would love to get the link to the program where you've been um, offering the development for the teachers. Is that sure. in your in it's, with your other links at the moment? It's plpnetwork.com. That's it. PLP. Um, PLP. Powerful Learning Practice. PLPnetwork.com. Great. So, uh, um, Lori has posted it to yep. the chat window. That's great. great. Thanks.
And uh, does anybody else have uh, any any last questions? This has been really, really helpful. Um, I'm the presenter just wondering chat. if there's... You're able to see those. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, Paul, if uh, no one is teaching... Chat. Yeah, if no one's teaching kids to do this well, then who's teaching the teachers? And, you know, that's 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 exactly the, the kind of spot we're in right now. Um, we, we really do need to begin to, as I said, you know, develop these types of skills and literacies in, in teachers first, if they're going to really uh, make that happen in, in classrooms as well. Um, I guess there's some questions just about how much time for professional development do you think is a good uh, mix um, in terms yeah. of, you know, re adjusting your style or adopting these new methods. Yeah. Um, and then there's another question here that I, that I do want to talk about, too, if you don't mind. But, um, oh, I, you know, what we, what we tell the people who participate in our PD program is that, you know, if they can invest a couple hours a week, um, and I know that two hours a week is tough to carve out. I'm not suggesting that that's a, a, an easy amount of time. But um, we really think that if, uh, if people are willing to, to get into the communities, to participate online, to start you know, doing some of these, uh, inter interacting in some of these networks and communities for a couple hours a week, that that really helps them take root in, in their practice and they begin to understand the ways that they can expand that. And, you know, just as in, in anything else, there's the, an implementation curve to this too, right, where at the beginning you're going to be doing new stuff and old stuff at the same time, but uh, if you work kind of through that first initial phase of it, that, you know, the new stuff replaces the old stuff in a lot of ways. And, and so there are a lot of things that you find yourself saving time on by, by using, um, I, I, again, by being connected and by using a lot of these tools. Um, I just also want to just address the, the question in the chat about, uh, you know, SLA, Science Leadership Academy, you know, that, that Chris built that school. He did. And uh, the question was, you know, what are schools without the ability to choose from an applicant pool that has a curriculum in place and has a staff who may or may not have these 21st century skills in place, what do they do? And so, you know, shameless self-promotion, but I mean, that really is why we wrote this book, um, why we wrote the uh, uh, Personal Learning Networks book. I mean, what we try to do in there is, is lay out a framework to take um, individual change into classroom change into systemic change within districts and schools. Um, and again, Rob and I, my co-author and I, uh, we just really believe that until, again, there are enough people who understand this from, you know, enough adults in the, in the system and in schools who understand this from a practical level, it's, uh, it's very difficult to, to make this kind of bigger change happen. So um, it is kind of a roadmap that we used at uh, the school where we were at, the school right down here, the road, down the road here, where we started this conversation probably about uh, seven, eight years ago now, and which has moved to a place where there is a lot of inquiry happening in the context of using social media to allow kids to individualize and personalize, yet still get to those goals and objectives and outcomes that the state wants for them and that the school district wants for them and everything else. Um, and, and so uh, there, I think there is a path to taking an existing school and moving it to a, a place where uh, things are happening pretty differently. It's not easy. It takes time. We, you know, anywhere from five to ten years, uh, depending on the, what's in place, you know, the leadership, the technology, the infrastructure, and all that. But uh, we just have come to the conclusion, too, let me just say, that um, even though, obviously, the economy right now is, is not in great shape and who knows what's going to happen four days from now and whatever else, right, um, we just think that really this is not so much of an economic conversation any longer. It's not a budgetary conversation, that there are ways to save money to make technology become a priority and, and that it's more a curriculum conversation now. It's, it's more about how do you, again, begin to rethink the things that you're doing in the classroom to uh, apply to or to take advantage of these types of connections and these types of networks with the understanding that every kid in that classroom is absolutely going to be learning in these types of spaces the rest of his or her life. Um, you know, the tools are going to change, but I don't think that these connections um, and, and these, these, this access that we have to, to uh, 
to all that information and knowledge and all that people, I think that's going to stick around for, for quite a long time. Yeah, I mean, I think something is going to happen almost um, by osmosis, um, you know, as this generation of kids, you know, becomes the adult generation. Right now yeah. we're at this sort of strange moment where we have the, the digital immigrants and the digital natives and, you know, there's this huge discrepancy. Um, but I think this sort of personalized learning and casual learning is happening whether it's in school or out of school. And so it's sort of infecting, you know, it, it's going to be affect change ultimately. It just may not be as quickly or directly as everybody would like. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's a, I, again, as a parent, I wish this was happening at a different time, <laughs> you know, because I, it, especially for me, because it's just really, really frustrating right now to know that yeah. all of these other types of opportunities are available, but that the systems that my kids are in right now really, they just can't get their brains wrapped around them right now. And, and that, that that's too much of a slow grind yeah. to make there's it. There's a lot of distance. A lot yep. of disenfranchised children yep. and adults too. You know, absolutely, very true. absolutely. Yeah. So I hope you're right. I hope it happens um, in the short term. I, I think it it's inevitable, well. but yep, I don't I know do that too. it's going to happen in a very direct way. <laughs> yeah. I I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's been so inspiring to get to talk with you today. We are grateful for you sharing your uh, ideas, your your projects, and your links. And I want to thank everybody for joining. And um, we're going to continue this conversation around how education can be transformed. And uh, we hope you join in to our future episodes. So thank you so very much, Will, for joining us today. It's been wonderful. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. OK. Yes. I'd like to add our thanks as well from the NMC to both of you for a fantastic session. Uh, this is the end of the current series of Live with Linda's, but we'll be planning more for the fall. I, um, I'm sure that we'll be getting those, uh, those dates and times out to you soon. The next round of uh, um, NMC webinars are going to focus on the HP Catalyst project uh, with the next one on August 24th. And then come September, we're going to be launching actually um, two or three series of webinars, and so you'll be hearing a lot more about that. To learn about all the NMC events and activities that you can take place, or take part in rather, check our Facebook page. That is the easiest and probably the best place to see the full range of NMC webinars, activities, and events. And so one more time, thank you to Linda. Thank you to Will. Fantastic session. Take care. Thank you, Larry. Bye, everybody. Thanks.